And let me just throw out there that I have um, been to powwows before, and there are some of the most otherworldly. We have massive powwows here once a year in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is where I am. Um, we have 21 Pueblos and the uh, Navajo Nation who are part of our uh, state. And so we hold powwows and they are the most otherworldly awesome experience, just kind of a grounding place to be. So I highly encourage you to go to the powwow if you have the ability to. Okay, so we're going to do, so that was my little plug for that. Um, I didn't know it was happening, but I just had to have a plug for it. All right, so um, we're going to talk about reframing the STEM classroom in the age of authenticity of AI through authentic equity-centered assessment and evaluation. This is kind of, um, we're going to do some things that are kind of um, set that I thought would be worth sharing. And then we're going to have some choose your own adventure as well. <laughs> so this is a talk that um, is conversational. I absolutely, absolutely would love for you to share your name, what you teach, and one thing you are excited about today in the chat. So if you would like to take a moment and do that, that would be amazing. And I can't actually see the chat <laughs> at all. So I'm hoping that, will you share a few things, Julia, who, that are um, yes, just for sure. you know, some, some places that we're at least teaching and what we're excited about? We're still waiting, it's a quiet bunch. Okay. <laughs> my name is Clarissa, I should say it for me. I, my name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh. Um, often I go by Rissa because my Twitter handle was at Rissa Chem for a very long, very long time. I'm no longer on Twitter, so don't try to find me there. But um, it's the same on Instagram, actually, <laughs> almost everywhere else, <laughs> Blue Sky. So if you want to try and find me some other social media, that'd be great. I teach chemistry and statistics um, and have for the last 22 years, which is, uh, well, 22 plus years. 22 years formally as a full-time community college teacher. And one thing I'm excited about today is being here with y'all. We're getting some, uh, some, some people in the chat, Christine, who you met, met, uh, who yeah. you met. she teaches Hi, second and third year biology and she's hoping for some help with AI. Um, awesome. Yeah. We have a few people from CPI posting and their, their roles. Um, we have, Awesome. Barakesh, who's here at TA, uh, who's doing the intro to business. He's hoping to learn uh, again about how to check AI with an assignment. So we should talk about that. <laughs> Absolutely. Xavier, who teaches STEM education in uh, the faculty of ed. Um, and nice. he has a cute little um, waving emoji. <laughs> Hi, Xavier. <laughs> uh, Abby's not a teacher, but uh, her brother's working on it. So she's very interested in learning more. If Yusuf awesome. is teaching epidemiology, I'm excited to Ooh, learn. Oh, nice. So. Yeah. Nice. All right. Excellent. It's we're a small bunch. So if you want to hop in with something um, in the chat that you have a question about, I think Julia will help me with that. But also, if you just want to, you know, unmute yourself at some point and ask me a question, I'm certainly used to it from students and I'm used to saying things and I'll try to stop at times and be like, OK, so the questions, but you can ask a question anytime. Um, our other colleague, Elisa, joined, and she teaches the history and future of storytelling, which is pretty interesting. Ooh. Ooh. She's excited I want to, to take that class STEM more broadly. I know it's it, it's that really fun amazing. to hear her talk about it. Um, and then we have Sharmila, who's joining, and she's an inter, a visiting international scholar. So oh, very exciting. cool. Very cool. Welcome, everyone. I'm really glad to, to see and hear that you're here. I'm excited for you and for me <laughs> in our learning community. To this morning. The QR code for the presentation is here. We'll also um, maybe put the the Google Docs um, uh, link. There you go. <laughs> it's the joy of being in your late 40s is that sometimes words are not as easy as they used to be. Um, so 
the link would be great in the chat so that y'all can see this. The presentation is longer than we will ever get to. Um, it has just an abundant amount of information. It also has uh, just a lot of references and links for you to explore more deeply. So please access it if you're interested. All right, so this talk was of course inspired by partially by my dissertation. My dissertation is on ungrading, so it is um, a constant thing on my mind to think about equitable um, assessment and evaluation. And we'll we'll distinguish what that is um, in a minute here. I've actually come to a different understanding of what exactly most people call that. Um, but it's also been inspired by the continued research on this conversation of how higher ed continues to change as we try to move past COVID, although COVID is of course a massive thing still, and the whirlwind of emotions and takes on <laughs> any new ed tech, including of course, generative AI, which I'm gonna most of the time talk about LLMs, which are lar large language models. Um, it's dense, it has a lot of ideas. Like I said, we're not gonna get to all of it, uh, we would need a long time to get to all of it. So there's a lot for you to get to later. But our, I always love the invitation of that this is a journey and it begins with both of us moving forward together. So I'm really thankful for you being here and I just welcome you all. Where to find me? Here's some places to find me. Um, I have a website, has most of this on it, but of course my email is available. I don't usually give out my email in talks, but I'm just feeling more friendly and communicative now that Twitter has died. <laughs> so please contact me if you have more information that you would like to talk about. Um, Blue Sky, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube. I'm on all of those social media, so please come find me. I'd love to talk to you more. Places to play. I love to talk, frame talks as uh, kind of this idea of there's a lot going on and we're going to try to focus some in the midst of this talk, but of course, sometimes you just can't do it. Even if you're here, even if you're trying to be present, sometimes it's hard. And sometimes you also need to do something in order to focus. And that's totally awesome and acceptable and welcome. So if you uh, need places to play, of course, the Zoom chat is a wonderful place to play. Um, social media, you know, <laughs> pick your poison of a platform. <laughs> But um, if you're going to be on social media, often hashtagging or adding the institution in the series is is part of what maybe would be good to do, um, just so other folks can pick up on it and carry that forward. And of course, your old your own space, which usually is like paper and pen for me. <laughs> so I like to get, get old school. Sometimes I'll get out my iPad and feel really wild and crazy, but that's, you know... <laughs> Your own spaces of your choice. All right, let's begin by checking in. We're going to go through the chat again. Um, in the chat, I would love for you to put um, two words, two words out of all of these words or a word that's not on here. We're just giving you choices, two words that describe how you are feeling today. And this is a ridiculously large <laughs> of words <laughs> but you know it kind of goes from the you know because we're all scientists or scientists in proxy by proxy <laughs> we're interested in science um you know this is an x-axis versus y-axis kind of thing and y-axis is energy and pleasantness is the x-axis so not, not they can be upbeat and content Oh, nice, nice. And they can be contradictory terms too, right? <laughs> like, you don't have to just pick out of the greens or the the yellows. We got some optimistic and happy, hopeful and grateful, reflective and restless, optimistic mm -hmm. and stressed. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel I feel Christine on that one. Yeah, is content and reflective. Jen is restless and focused. Nice, nice. <laughs> like holding, holding it. those intention. That's good. Yeah, 
I like it. I like it very much. And that's that's how moods are, right? I mean, feelings can be in tension at the same time, which is awesome. I'm feeling um, hopeful. I hope that y'all will get some at least one thing out of this presentation that you feel like you can take forward. And I also feel um, thoughtful and thankful. I'm going to do that's two. That's three. Technically, yes, I can count. I'm a statistician in my free time. <laughs> Although sometimes my wife would debate me on that. Uh, but <laughs> I think those are held together for the moment for me. And let's give ourselves a pat on the back. One of the things that I've realized in terms of COVID is that we just are not spending a lot of time being really thoughtful about what we've accomplished. And over the last four years, yes, it's been four years since 2020, we have accomplished just a tremendous amount. We have pivoted, we've modified, we've created, we've endured, we've survived. And we have done all of these things in the midst of one of the largest pivot, pivotal moments in higher ed that um, has existed. And so let's just take a minute to congratulate ourselves on a lot of work and a job well done. Yay. And recognize that we are also exhausted and our students are exhausted. And so one of the things that um, we at least at uh, CNM are seeing is that we're starting to see the traumatic stress start to be released in our students and there's some real repercussions that are coming from that. And so we're exhausted and we can recognize that and, and be okay with that. So while I'm going to talk today and we're going to talk today about equity-minded assessment and evaluation and generative AI, um, if you're not ready for this discussion, I, the link is, you've already have the link. And we can send them out in other ways too if needed. And you can refer to them later if now is really not the right time. Okay, if now is the right time though, if you're feeling really good about it, let's focus. This is a beautiful New Mexico sunset. We're gonna take two deep breaths just to kind of be like, okay, let's center ourselves. Okay, first deep breath. I love a beautiful sunset. Okay, second deep breath. Okay, time to focus. Let's talk about generative AI and LLMs. All right, LLMs, in my humble opinion, are simply tools that we can choose to use or to help us write. In my uh, thoughts, I came up with some pros and cons. There are other pros and cons than these. This is not a comprehensive list, but it is a beginning. Right. The use of LLMs continues to grow. It's not as exponential as it was at the beginning of 2023, but it certainly is still happening. And learning to prompt LLMs effectively and clearly is quickly becoming a critical skill in our world. Okay. And if you're like, well, I'm not really at the place of prompting LLMs. Well, students are. And often those prompts are similar to the search terms that we use in Google and such. And so we're just putting them into sentences or questions or something along those lines. And so learning to really do this well, I think is becoming a skill that either is critical now or will be critical on the horizon. Also learning how to edit and reframe the output is a is becoming a fundamental skill that we're starting to see. Um, it doesn't give us brilliance, <laughs> contrary to popular opinion, and sometimes it makes stuff up. If you ever <laughs> thought about LLMs, uh, it is notorious for making up citations. In fact, I've been contacted a couple of times in terms of people saying, hey, did you, you know, can you tell me more about this thing you wrote? I'm like, I didn't write that. So, you know, just FYI, really learning to edit this and think about it as critically as possible is really going to be a skill that we're going to move forward with. 
the cons llms do not have a distinct voice they are an amalgam of many different voices um if you feed it exclusively your work there's a possibility i was just talking with a friend of mine who works at a, a very large um industrial setting that does a lot of work for like government and such and um he was saying that with the help of specific coding for him and feeding it exclusively his writing, um, which would take a lot, right? This is a the very specialty oriented thing. He's written tens of thousands of pages and has, uh, you know, a lot of work. He actually has a chat GPT version that can spit out something very close to what he would have spit out. Um, in terms of writing down a white paper or something along those lines. That's a really exclusive thing at the moment, but I think we're going to see more of that as we go on. Uh, the distinction of the voice, which takes um, a fair amount of knowing your own voice to begin with. So there's still a, a fair amount of learning curve that it takes to get to the place of writing something in a way that the LM, LLM can start to mimic. They may or may not be trained on ethical or reasonable data sets. This is machine learning at its best, y'all. So these are data sets that it's being trained on. Um, those ethical or reasonable data sets are not always given. Um, there's a huge number of fantastic ethicists. I have only listed actually amazing black women here who are ethicists, um, but there are several others who are just doing amazing work. Um, and so, you know, look, look to their work to start to say, okay, is, are these reasonable or not? For Timnit and Joy, I actually linked the institutes that they have started. Um, so those, uh, those are institutes that have larger than just them working on these things together. And so uh, you might take a look at those if you're interested in more information about that. And of course, the upkeep and use of the LLMs exacts a toll from the environment and from people. The environment, um, it, to cool the computers that are running the machine learning, um, that's just a huge amount of water usage. And so, you know, you might look into the social justice points of that. Julia said that um, Brenna went into this as well. So I know that she has some really interesting points about this. Brenna and Anne-Marie have a lot of thoughts about the environmental impact of LLMs um, and also the people impact. Refugees are literally being paid peanuts to clean the machine learning data sets so, and the output. So I, I would look into that as well as you're considering and definitely help apprise our students that this is not just an amazing thing that just came out of nowhere. <laughs> but the use of LLMs in the classroom, we can of course, we'll talk a little bit more about how we could use LLMs like ChatGPT to generate content for our students to curate or evaluate and why we would wanna do that. Um, if I think if students are allowed to use LLMs in your classes, they should at least be citing their usage of that LLM, right? They should be saying something a lot. And that doesn't have to be a formal citation. It just needs to be, hey, I'm using this to enhance um, my own language. And detectors don't work at all most of the time. So half of the time, what we've seen with AI detectors is about half, they, they are prone to type one and type two error in st statistics. So half the time uh, they detect, at least half of the time, they detect AI usage when there hasn't been any. And the other half of the time <laughs> or more, they uh, detect no AI usage when there has been. <laughs> so please don't use these. They are not helpful. Um, the best way to detect AI probably usage at this point is to ask students to work and rework their um, 
whatever you're requiring of them, their papers, what have you, um, which is actually part of the learning of writing, right? To take that, whatever they're going to turn in and give feedback on it and redo it and redo it and redo it. Um, and once you know their voice, if they give you something that's really different, then you're like, hey, this is really different. <laughs> Let's have a conversation about this. As opposed to just being like, you know, I think that you have used an AI detector. But that's that's my, I know that there are constraints on that. Certainly with large classes, there are constraints on that. But it's definitely something that uh, I would clearly think about and be reflective about before you start accusing students that they've used AI. All right. Um, and yeah, there's a... <laughs> cartoon for you to enjoy. All right, so here is our menu for today. We are actually going to be going to different things. I'm going to do the framing assessment and evaluation because I really like that part. <laughs> That's kind of new and important to me, and I think it's kind of the heart of the talk. But then we'll start choosing uh, what we want to go to next. And our choices are emancipatory pedagogies, belonging, cognitive biases, intersectionality, rigor and trust, COVID and STS. STS is a word that means secondary or is an acronym for secondary traumatic stress and active learning. And then there are also, just because, you know, why stop there? Um, there are extra slides at the end of the slide presentation and references that we won't even get to that aren't even options. So if you are looking through the presentation, go to the end <laughs> at some point. All right, framing assessment and evaluation. Here's the heart of what I'm talking about today. I always love to start with a quote that really encapsulates kind of where I am pedagogically. And Bell Hooks, this quote from Teaching to Transgress has been probably one of the quotes that I go back to over and over and over again. So I'm gonna read it aloud, even though I know you, how to re you know how to read because it just is so poignant to me. The classroom remains the most radical space of possibility in the academy, urging all of us to open our minds and hearts so that we can know beyond the boundaries of what is acceptable, so that we can think and rethink, so that we can create new visions. Gosh, I love that. We have a, a role in the creation of new possibility, and that is... And it can be a radical space for us. And so that is just, I have to keep that in mind every time I talk about anything, including in the classroom. All right, let's start with how humans learn, because it's actually very close to how machines learn as well. <laughs> so usually we try something out, we fail, and then we reflect on what happened. And then the top arrow where we iterate back we iterate and we try something new out and then we probably fail. Sometimes we don't fail, so we could just try something out, reflect on why it worked, right? Um, sometimes if you're feeling really wild and crazy, you can prepare with research or background in advance, which is of course what the machines do. But this is part of how humans learn and this is absolutely part of how machines learn as well. Machines are not that smart. They do not have the reflective piece. They have kind of a built-in algorithm to iterate. So the re reflection is done for them um, in, in many ways. And guess who does that? Humans. <laughs> and so you build that into the code, right? So just to make sure we don't have, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. AI is is not smart. Really not smart. Machine learning is not smart. Um, it is uh, the smart humans that coded it <laughs> that are what's becoming a reality, right? So we do not have Jarvis. We're never going to have probably Jarvis, at least in our lifetimes. And so, you know, keep that in mind when you're thinking about what AI can and cannot do. In terms of framing assessment, I've started to realize that while I really like making a distinction between assessment and evaluation, 
as two separate things. Almost always when you hear the words evaluation, people think of student evaluations. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about evaluations of students that you do in your classes, which is most often done through feedback and grading. Currently, grading and feedback and ungrading are actually under the larger umbrella of assessment. They're just hammered in there, even though it's actually two kind of distinct things. You have the learning assessments, which try to measure student performance and semi-equate it to student learning. And that you, examples of this include projects, portfolios, papers, exams, quizzes, homework, blah, blah, blah. And then you have an evaluative assessment that takes looks at these assessments against some set of standards and then talks about how those, you know, the assessment itself, the learning assessment matches or doesn't match these standards. And so those standards can be external or internal to the class. When I talk about external, I'm talking about like accrediting body standards. I'm talking about things like reviews. So like nursing has a whole set of ex extensive standards that are required. And so those are what your what student work is evaluated against, right? Um, they can also be internal to the class. So just remembering that we do have this power and we often do it without thinking. Internal standards often are personal instructor standards, but they could also be personal student standards. So students come up with their own standards that they would like to be evaluated against or standards that the class voted on. If you want to go full participant democracy here, <laughs> you could say, OK, we're going to have standards that you yourself have for your own learning journey. We're going to have standards for the entire class. And then there are some external standards that either the department sets or whomever sets this crediting body sets or whatever that I have to evaluate you against. And this is what they are. And this is how I'm going to evaluate the, you against those standards. OK, your work. Examples of evaluative assessments include grading, ungrading, feedback, peer assessment, so on and so forth. Just a note here, of course, all assessment can be formative or summative, right? So we've seen that increases in formative assessment have been repeatedly correlated with increases in longitudinal learning. And there are several articles, Black and William did just a lot more articles than these two. <laughs> And chapters and books, but um, these are two ones to get started with if you're interested in that. And we know that as well. Formative grading would be things like your exams grading, although that could be also summative if they're high stakes exams, um, grading on homework, grading on projects, so on and so forth. Um, where a summative exam, uh, summative evaluative assessments would be something like your final grade. Categories of assessment for me include kind of big ideas here, right? We can kind of put assessment into creation oriented assessment. Um, and this is almost, when I think about this, I'm almost always thinking about learning assessments. So things that were doing in the class to kind of measure learning or at least performance at that moment. So creation, right? Students generate original content. Curation, they take all kinds of things throughout the semester and evaluate content that's already made either by them or others. And they add transitions, continuity, whatever, and put it together in innovative ways. So things like portfolios, projects, Concept maps are all curation based ideas. Um, but like I always think like to think in curation that there has to be some kind of reflective aspect to it. When you go to a museum, you just don't see the paintings on the wall. If you go to a painting museum or sculptures or whatever it is that's in the museum, cars, I don't know, whatever. Um, you also see some kind of lovely placard that the museum employees have gotten together that you know, give some background and why this one is particularly important and the impact that painting, sculpture, whatever, made on the world, right? So I like to think of curation as like some background as to why you picked this particular thing, 
you know, and then what, of course, what impact it made on your learning? Why is it part of this larger thing that we're putting together? And then there's evaluation, right? Students take something that's already been generated and figure out how to make it work for their assignment. One of the things that is really um, important in the evaluation piece is that often evaluation is one of the most important aspects of what we do when folks get to industry or something along those lines, right? In writing, uh, we certainly have to be able to evaluate what has been written and see if it kind of matches what was proposed um, or what the point, you know, whatever the point or prompt was. Um, and that's also true for things like coding, right? Um, often in computer science, we just, I just went through a whole moment with the computer science department at the University of New Mexico. We did their ABET accreditation, came out awesome. And I actually really enjoyed it. ABET accreditation, which I think I might be one of the only people in the world who really enjoys ABET accreditation, but I did. Um, and one of the things that I was talking about with them was that often their assignments are about creating code, but when they get into the you know, jobs that they're going to go into almost always. It's about seeing the legacy code, figuring out whether that works or not still, generating perhaps some code in the midst to kind of make it do something new. But that takes a lot of evaluation. And one of the things that LLMs can be used for is to generate writing or coding that someone could evaluate. Right, because one of the things that happens in peer review, especially when you're learning how to do peer review, is that someone's feelings can get hurt because you don't know how to give good feedback yet. But if you generate it with ChatGPT, I can guarantee the machine doesn't care about whether it gets its feelings hurt or not. In terms of putting together all of what I consider evaluative assessment, this is just kind of a snapshot of what all of the different kinds of evaluative assessment that I've seen over the years look like. This is going to be a figure that's found in a, a article that's going to be submitted like this week. <laughs> and it's already been accepted, you know, it's been invited. So it's been accepted as long as I hit the parameters that are needed. Um, and so you'll be able to see that soon. It's in CBE Life Sciences. Um, and then for more information on what the ungrading practices are, which are in a different font than the grading practices, <laughs> just to make things interesting and tricky, um, then there's a, there's a, a, you know, a jump here that goes to a different part of the uh, presentation. And it gives you kind of what each of these things are. Basically what I'm doing here is I'm of course making a graph because I love graphs. I'm a scientist, y'all. We love the, and a mathematician, right? Love those graphs. They're fantastic, right? So Y axis here is from student learning agency to instructor compliance. Okay, so basically more agency versus less agency. And then the X axis here is from more student learning to less student learning. Uh, and actually, I did that backwards. I did, it. <laughs> I did it right to left instead of left to right. <laughs> okay, so we read left. You get it. Okay, good. Um, and so, and it's actually right in the alt text too. So anyone who's having a problem, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so in the font here, I have uh, grading on a curve, uh, which grading on a curve is by far the most instructor compliant and the least student learning oriented. Traditional grades, traditional grades being something that's like, um, a number-based grade based off of a 100-point scale type thing, right, that is entirely given based off of it from an instructor. Um, that is um, kind of also less about student learning, much more about student performance and much more instructor compliance, right? There's not a lot of student learning choice in that. Um, equity grades, which equity grades are kind of my word. It's not exactly the same as standards-based grading, but it has a lot in common with it. Equity grades basically say, okay, instead of giving you a hundred point rubric, I'm going to do A, B, C, F as the choices. Um, maybe D, if you can do it, D is actually really hard to assign and you do accuracy-based grades, 
Um, so content accuracy based grades based off of that. The thing that equity grades get you versus traditional grades, just to give you a sense really quickly, is that if you think about a four point scale, A, B, C are all passing. F is the only thing that's not passing. So out of a four point scale, 25% of the grades would be not passing or 25% of the idea of the things that you could assign are not passing. Whereas with traditional grades, 59% is not passing, which doesn't make just a huge amount of sense. Um, always, at least in, in the world that I want to see in the classroom. So that's, kind of where that is, just to give you a thought there. Binary grading, uh, much more about student learning, much more, a little bit more about choice. Um, that's pass fail. And then you have all of these different kinds of ungrading, right? So mastery learning grading isn't really a kind of ungrading that's actually just really great practice. That's the idea in terms of learning, learning requires remember failure humans learn by failing one of the things that we know is that when you just have a one-time uh, assignment learning assignment and just say hey here you go if they fail that they have no opportunity to improve and build on their knowledge and so mastery learning or grading basically says Okay, for a certain number of assignments, and often there's, for large classes, there's a token economy that comes with this. Um, that is basically, they get a certain number of tokens, they can use them for uh, redos to some point so that you're not just doing redos all the time. But that kind of mastery learning and grading is just really part of the learning. It's acknowledging that humans learn by failing and that when we just give an assignment and they fail it, there's no opportunity for actual learning there. So it's a place of being able to do redos. And then of course, self-assessments, narrative evaluation, interview grace based grading portfolios so on and so forth self assessments are kind of what often is referred to as ungrading i think of ungrading is much more of an umbrella uh, term but not everyone does and so self assessments are where students give their own grade okay there are levels of learning and evaluative assessments, right? There's kind of this idea that it could be part of active learning, it could be part of inclusive or an authentic learning, and then there's the, this immense emancipatory learning um, and assessment. Um, Equity-minded, we'll talk about in a minute here, but active learning is basically what you have come to probably know, which is students work on the challenges of learning in class instead of at home. So that's the idea of, it doesn't mean you don't lecture ever. It just means that your lectures are constrained to a certain amount of time and then you work on problems and then maybe you go over those problems or whatever. Um, so it's really trying to do the work of learning in class, either through groups, individuals, so on and so forth. Um, inclusive or authentic learning gives a new kind of level to it. The pedagogies of kindness, care, trauma-informed kind of can fit into this. Inclusive um, learning can is actually kind of this term, an inclusive classroom, excuse me, is a term that has come to um, be so broad that it sometimes doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Um, and so you will hear folks say inclusive learning and mean everything that I'm talking about in terms of the emancipatory learning. So it's one of those terms that you have to define. For me, inclusive authentic learning works within the system to try to be as equitable and humanistic as possible. So basically, I'm thinking my students as humans, I'm trying to get to know more about them. I'm doing things that might activate their uh, prior knowledge and experiences in the classroom. I'm trying to be equitable about what's happening in terms of their learning. Often I'll try to give them some amount of voice in either the design or what they're actually learning. Okay, so this is 
Um, and I'm keeping certain things in mind, like trauma informed has a set of things that I'm trying to keep in mind. Right. So, um, you know, flexible due dates, that kind of idea. All right. For me, that's inclusive and authentic learning. I think equity minded, which is starting to get towards emancipatory. It isn't quite, it tries to kind of bridge the working within the system and, and breaking some constraints. But emancipatory is kind of the edge of this, the most radical. And this is where we get things like critical pedagogy, culturally responsive pedagogies, open pedagogies, ungrading, so forth, so on and so forth. That's really basically saying the system is rigged. We know the system is rigged. And so I'm going to break the constraints of that system as much as possible to benefit my learners. So that is trying to dismantle parts of the system, not trying to work within it, trying to dismantle parts of the system to say, this is a system that is not, cannot ever be fully equitable to all peoples because it was based off of, um, I mean, really, truly, I hate to say this out loud, but I'm going to say it anyway. It was based on a white supremacist model. There it is. That um, benefited males, mainly. Um, because, as we know from eugenics, eugenics basically was the idea that we're going to make a, hu we can say this for scientists, right? We're going to make a human standard because there's no standards in, in when we measure humans. So I'm going to make a human the standard. And that human standard was a white dude who was like 5'8 or 5'9, who was not Jewish. <laughs> right? And then I'm going to measure everyone else against th that person. And that's how we got eugenics. And that's how we got a lot of the systems of today. So unfortunately, um, this is kind of the radical edge. However, it's the radical edge in which I live. So <laughs> just... <laughs> warning in advance if you're like wow that's a lot just know that the rest of it will also be a lot okay good all right in terms of framing assessment and evaluation there are possible case studies right before we get into that equity-minded teaching at a glance is a really fabulous book i'm gonna hold it up because it's so good i think it mirrors my image so there you go that's probably not something you can see really easily but hey you know what if you can't see it easily if you access this powerpoint at the bottom of this slide you can get access for free to the ebook right and so you can look at that anytime you darn well please um, they're starting to do the emancipatory thing through the critical reflection. One of the things we see in emancipatory pedagogies over and over again is this idea that you have to be critically reflective about um, what you're doing in the classroom. It's not just with a mind of like, did this work? Did this not work? Was this right? It's also saying, hey, was this equitable? Was this really honoring the the voices who are here or did i really just honor the voices of people who spoke up or the folks who were white or whatever so it's trying to design for equity um it it has inclusive day-to-day -day teaching there are key themes right the holistic support for faculty and student well-being is one of them and we'll talk about that at some point here maybe if we get to intersectionality um there's authentic relationships there's uh an honoring of the culture traditions what have you socio-historical knowledge of the groups that are in your everyone who's in your classroom attention to context and advocacy for change right so it really gets close to emancipatory pedagogies and it probably is fairly synonymous with it um, I think that's was the intention of Brian Dewsbury and Mays Amon and Flower Darby and Isis Artsy Vega. But um I I think um they they never explicit, explicitly say, hey, we're gonna break the system. <laughs> and so that's why I make a distinction. Pedagogies of care, right, are is kind of the foundation. Any version of what you're doing. In the classroom could incorporate some amount of participatory design tries to 
give some agency to learners, try to be equitable, center the learner, uh, make care of the foundation of your classroom interactions. Um, right, pants, pedagogies of emancipation are a little more radical than that, although they incorporate all of these things as well. In terms of participatory design, I tend to, for those of you who are instructional designers or have looked into instructional design as, as well, I tend to do the SAM version. I am not an Addy person. Addy is one of those terms that actually is very much like inclusive classrooms or inclusive pedagogies. It's so broad as to mean anything under the sun that you would do to <laughs> design in a classroom. Um, so you have to define what you're doing. Um, I tend to like SAM, which is this kind of idea of successive models that you're making as quickly as possible. <laughs> so I'm a quick prototyper. I like to kind of be like, okay, we're going to do this. Let's go in and do it. <laughs> and so this is my quick prototype for uh, participatory design. Uh, you're going to have students suggest and vote on flexible aspects of the course design. I just warn you here, do not ever have students suggest and or vote on anything you really deeply care about or is required by your department. Right? You want things that uh, you really could care less how it goes. <laughs> if that's your entire syllabus, you might think about your syllabus and whether it really needs to be that way. But if, in terms of the flexible course design, right, you're just saying, Okay, I really don't care whether we do quizzes or homework or how the quizzes are counted or how the homework is counted, um, unless that's decreed my, by my department. Um, I don't care whether, for instance, on my for my organic when I did this, I called it a liquid syllabus. It's not what actually um, the liquid syllabus term means, but I was basically like, okay, I'm going to highlight everything in my syllabus that is flexible. And we're going to talk about that in my organic chemistry class. Um, and what we ended up doing, I offered them things like, I was like, you have to have, we have to have exams that's required by my department and my school. They have to be a minimum of 60% of the grade. I'm going to do exams a little differently because I do ungrading with exams. So we're going to have the exam, but we're also going to do some ungrading with that. We can talk about that later if you want to. Um, but I really don't care how these are counted, right? Do you want to drop the lowest one out of the three or four that we have? Do you want to do one as like your highest one is 25% of the grade and the second highest one is like 10 or 15% of your grade and then the lowest one as the remaining so that the lowest one impacts you the least, right? Those kinds of things where you really could care less how it goes. Of course, this is still grading. This isn't entirely ungrading, but, you know, it gives them some choice over their own learning process and how it's going to go. And choice can be everything sometimes. So it's not full agency, but it's something, right? And then you implement the course using the co-created design and standards. If you don't implement the course with the co-created design and standards, don't ask, right? It's, it's worse to ask and then not do anything about it <laughs> and not do anything with it. Um, and then you want some reflections on whether that worked, right? And then you're gonna evaluate the design from your point of view, did this kind of hit the buy, did it have student buy-in? Did they have the agency that I could have given them? Are there places for more agency? Does it have an equitable impact on all groups? And then iterate as needed. And you can iterate during the semester. It's a quick prototype, it can change. Right, responsiveness is key. If you have to give out a syllabus, um, get make your syllabus as flexible as the department will allow you to allow for iteration. And then there's the possibility of something much more systematic. Now, when I did this, I did it for a, we were redesigning a, a computer science, uh, like 101 class. Um, it, this was um, the beginning class in Python. Um, so that's kind of where this came from. 
but you could certainly modify it for whatever you're doing, right? Emancipatory pedagogical practices, it has active learning practices. They were actually in a, a, a learning studio that was specifically designed for active learning in groups. So it has round tables, it has nine chairs per table, it has three computers that they can use, it has whiteboards, it has right all kinds of things you can put their input um, on screens so on and so forth so it's really meant to have active learning practices um and people who like peer learning facilitators who help with those active learning practices so just for context of course active learning was going to be part of this and we can go into that more but um emancipatory pedagogical practices i felt like asset framing was really important right so um tapping funds of knowledge that's a, a key phrase in asset framing by the way that's one of the main ideas funds of knowledge and community cultural worth are kind of the two major theories undergirding asset framing so that is um, you're basically trying to ask students about their culture, their prior experiences, their family, their ways, whatever they bring into the classroom. And you're trying to integrate that into project design and in reflective learning, final project portfolio, so on and so forth. So it's not just a reflection on their learning in that classroom for that content. It is saying what you have brought to this class is important and it's not just important for you it's important for everyone else in your group and everyone else in the class and so let's really explore that okay and for those of you who are like they don't bring anything to science um sci we in stem are really bad at asset framing stem is one of the least least asset framed uh, groups of fields um, that is out there because we tend to come in with this idea of either everything you learned was wrong or you're blank at best, you're a blank slate that I'm going to write some number of things upon um, without acknowledging that, like, for instance, for chemistry, if they've cooked their whole lives as students, that is actually important knowledge for them to have because Often, if you have cooked, if you've done culinary school, if you've bartended, you actually do much better in lab because you have a sense of measurement, you have a sense of glassware, you have a sense of like, oh, sometimes we just need a pinch and we're going to say use two milliliters, but what we really mean is a pinch, right? <laughs> of this stuff. So, just, or two, two milligrams or whatever it is. Um, so, it's really a fundamental change in the way we think about who students are and what they bring to the table of learning. And it, I sometimes screw up asset framing over and over and over again. And I'm like, I am learning. <laughs> this is a failure proposition sometimes. Um, but you know, you're doing the best you can. Authentic assessments and ungrading, right? So peer review of projects, portfolio cur curation, collaborative evaluation for the final grade. Um, collaborative val evaluation, I feel like, is the heart of ungrading. It's saying, I'm not just going to give you a grade based off of what everything I know. I'm going to integrate the learner into this conversation um, because their perception of what the standards were and my perception of the standards that I'm holding their work against may be different. And then self-review checkpoints throughout the course. Um, critical reflective learning, right? So learning journals, documenting how you're learning and what you're using and uh, like what resources am I using, what per seems to be very helpful, what doesn't, um, what, what could I do that would be different that might be helpful as well. And then tra trauma-informed pedagogical practices like feedback mechanisms um, so that uh, students have as much agency as possible and to maintain the participatory design, mastery learning. This was a, a 90 person class, actually it was a 120 person class. So they absolutely were going to implement the token economy. They gave every student like three or four tokens to begin with. Um, 
and then they could earn more throughout the class if they were doing feedback or doing all kinds of other things. Tokens basically are like, I want to do a, what tokens mean is that the student gets this token, they give you the token when they want to do a redo. They do the token counts as any explanation of why they need to redo that. Right. So they don't need to lay out why they're giving you the token, what the reasoning behind the token is. They just have a token. They're giving it to you. They're using it. They get a redo. Okay, so that's kind of the idea. Um, low stress collaborative learning environment. That was the tables and what have you. And then uh, suggested due dates with some flexible late policy. The flexible late policy, you know, you want to make that happen. Sometimes you can't, you know, if you're integral integrating peer review, you kind of need them to have done something by the date that you do the peer review. <laughs> if they haven't, then that becomes problematic for the peer review. Um, so give yourself, I, I wrote a paper recently on how our um, acknowledgement of students as whole persons sometimes comes into conflict with our own understanding of ourselves as a whole person. So give yourself some space to do what you need to do as well while trying to see folks as whole persons. All right. Any questions on that part? I'm going to ask people to turn on the camera and ask the questions if they if they do have them. Oh, fuck on. Yeah. I didn't know if you could see my camera the whole time. I was like nodding at you. Yeah, I did. It was very okay, helpful. Good. Thank you for okay. the nodding. I love that. I was like, am I just nodding into the... <laughs> okay. No, you weren't just nodding it into the atmosphere, into the ether. ether. <laughs> into the ether. And if you don't have any questions right now, totally fine. <laughs> I'm just giving some room. I mean, that last slide um, is was huge. It's like, yeah. <laughs> It's yeah. <laughs> it a lot of that I, I see in social science, but not so much in STEM. Um, mm -hmm. Especially things like peer review. How do you imagine mm -hmm. that working in a like? Do you do that in chemistry? Yeah. So peer review is absolutely critical for journal, right? So if if you're going to do journal review, so if you have majors, you absolutely need to integrate peer review at some point. It's earlier. It's better to do it earlier. Um, and if you have a cohort of students, this works beautifully, right? The first semester you do maybe one, two peer reviews, kind of calibrate against something like chat GPT and just see if we all say, saw the same things or if we saw different things and how that looks, right? So you go through the process of actually everyone evaluates it, everyone looks at it, um, and we're not really reviewing each other's. And then, you know, the next semester you might just integrate in, like, let's start reviewing each other's. Let's make sure that our feedback is, you know, positive, um, uh, focused, um, in, you know, actually getting to the point feedback. <laughs> because the worst thing about feedback, right, is that it has to be understood kind of in similar ways by the person who's giving it and the person who's receiving it. So, and, and that's one of the hardest things to do actually well. So trying to make sure that we question that and, and continue to try to work on our feedback so that we're really giving um, feedback that is helpful um, as opposed to feedback that's just mean. I see important. that Chris, Christine has her hand up, so... Oh yeah, sorry. That was a very long answer to your very short no, question. No, Christine, great. go for it. So I will say that I've played around with due dates and that, and I usually would give extra days that the assignment's available for submission. Sure. Um, depending on like the student can reach out, but yeah, it over the many years and even before COVID, it really doesn't seem to matter when the due date is students leave working on it until the day it's due and that's the issue yeah i mean i, I i'm not sure that that's all students but certainly that's some large portion especially of lower um 
of like freshmen and sophomore students, I think. Um, uh, and I think that a lot, I mean, there are arguments that teaching is almost entirely communication and framing. <laughs> so um, I think when you're, you're talking with them about this, right, the, the due dates, um, you want to frame it in a way that conveys why you're doing what you're doing and why it's important for um, it to be that way. Um, if you're not reflective <laughs> as, a, as a teacher, which I'm sure all of you are, so I'm sure I'm talking to the choir, but if, if you're not reflective yourself, you probably haven't thought that through. You're just like due dates or due dates and that's what they are. But if you start saying things like, look, we have due dates because I do want to do peer review or we're doing due dates because if I leave it until the end of the semester, there's a real possibility that you'll fall behind. And especially in something like lab, you always have those students who have gone through the entirety of coming to the lab class. And, you know, I'm like, I can't grade what I don't have. And so therefore they, don't do well in the course and have to retake it. And I'm like, you invested a huge amount of time. I know you were here. I know you did it. And I can't give you credit for that unless you show me something about your learning um, or your, at least what you were getting from that lab. So sometimes um, flexible due dates um, are not helpful, especially to, to, I have found that neurodivergent students do not like flexible due dates. Um, that is not helpful for them. Um, uh, not all neurodivergent students, but some, particularly those with ADHD, like my son, who I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's just make this a hard deadline and then be gracious if it doesn't work out, <laughs> right? But I, you're probably not the person I'm talking to you when I'm saying flexible late policy. I'm saying this for for folks who have hard deadlines and you have to send, I just had someone who uh, did this where they had to send a picture of their dead grandmother to the, to the professor, like actually wanted a picture of, and I'm like, whoa. Like, that's next level, y'all. That's not okay. <laughs> like, there is a possibility of treating humans in your class as humans. And that is the piece that we're really going for here. And so please treat your students as humans. That's what I would be begging you at this point, begging of you. Um, and that's that's the piece that I'm really talking about when I'm talking about suggested due dates, right? So you can have hard due dates, but then flexibility, if something goes awry, because things go awry, either in terms of dropping or in terms of saying, hey, you're having a really hard time. Let me give you this exam at another time or let me... Uh, extend out that due date so that you have a little more time to think about it and work on it, right? It's an acknowledgement of the humanity of the class more than anything else. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Anyone else have questions? I could keep asking questions. <laughs> Maybe I'll just keep asking and then people can think about their questions. Um, sure. Although I do know that I some it. people have appointments, so I will. Yeah. 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 So if yeah. they do have to go, it's nothing personal. <laughs> They're on to their next meeting. Oh, yeah. Um, no, so not at all. That, I, you, we love having you here. We ha love that you have to go on to your next thing. So I understand. I guess in the same vein of what I was asking about, um, in the STEM context. So I do see this in education and social sciences a lot. So a lot of the things like asset framing, and I know you were kind yeah. of talking about bringing yourself and creating this portfolio. Um, what what does a portfolio look like in STEM? Is it still a collection of writing in your mind? Or is there other ways that you would be collecting artifacts? 
So, so artifacts are artifacts, right? So exams could be artifacts. If I still have to give exams, then maybe that's an artifact. And the asset framing here for the portfolio is really to say, look, when I, um, when I took this, I mean, even, even asset framing, I mean, the, the goal of, of asset framing in large part is to build trust with students so that you can start to give feedback that is interpreted well as opposed to is a personal attack right so um and it's also to to really acknowledge that what you bring to the classroom is important okay so do a fold kind of idea so when uh you're doing portfolios um final project portfolios i would absolutely say that like okay for me, like, yes, things we did in the classroom are absolutely important to, and, and what you're doing here is this is a, a claims and evidence kind of idea, right? You're giving me evidence for the claim of whatever you think your grade is, right? So portfolios are often used in self-assessments, right? If I'm going to give you a final grade and I have to do that because the university requires it, then we're going to, we're going to, you're going to come to the table with what you think you have as a grade. And I'm going to come to the table with what I think you have as a grade. And we're going to talk about our claims and back that up with evidence, right? So it's also a part of the scientific method to do this, to, to, you know, have a hypothesis and have evidence that really, um, shows that you have thought through this and have evidence for it. Now, having said that, for a fraud, final project portfolio, I want to know, um, I want to know multiple things at once. I want to have evidence from the class, right? You came to exams, you took exams, but do I exactly care what their performance on the exam was? Yes, ish, but I really care what they learned from it, right? So, if I don't actually have a redo system, then what I want them to do is I want them to go through and I want them to correct what they didn't know. I want them to think through why they didn't know it on the exam. I want them to really reflect on what they could have done for the next exam. And I want them to, I want to see a progression of their learning either inside class, which I would really love. That would be the easiest to work with. And, but also outside of class, right? Did you do progressive concept maps? Did you do for each chapter that really got much more detailed and connected with previous chapters? Do you have, um, you know, some real reflections about what was going on during your semester that kept you from being able to do all of the things you wanted to do in class and how that has um, impacted your learning? Right. I, I want, I'm actually at this point far more interested in the learning that happens when we're not doing direct learning assessments and the learning that happens in the curation of the portfolio. Right. So what, what are the placards saying? That's what I want to know. <laughs> right? So in terms of asset framing it, it for me it reflects all of that right it's all of the reflective learning it's all of the the you know how did you do this i often have people who are like i learned how to cook better in your class and i'm like I, it was a general chemistry one class why well the lab really taught me about measurement i got myself a scale i started to do these things i want to know all about that too right like this is not just what happens in your classroom it's about what happens in that semester for that student that's great. I love that. That, that is one of our recommendations for connecting to personal experience, but it's great to have some examples in STEM that, um, because I'm yeah. more familiar with other areas. Xavier just had to go like many other people um, might have to. Bye, so, Xavier. so he was That's just awesome. saying he'll explore and thank you for the presentation. Of course, of course. Should we do another section? Well, I don't, I don't know. Let, what are, let's see how the, there's, they're, <laughs> they're all, they're all a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have time actually, but um Okay. <laughs> okay. Look through the rest of the sections. They're all really Yeah, but it's great that um I'll I think this the um 
the slides have been shared in the chat so people can explore all of those on their own yeah. time and they can reach out because your email is on there. <laughs> I know. They can and I, email I absolutely, you. I'm actually doing, so the belonging um, section, I actually put at the very beginning of this section, a different presentation. Mm. Um, there's a much longer presentation because belonging is the thing that I'm doing this year. So, <laughs> which is funny to say that. <laughs> Sorry. I just realized how that song I'm doing belonging. It's great. Um, so I'm researching how to, so I have a fellowship this year, I have a full course release, and I'm researching how to increase belonging in the classroom, particularly, and between peers and within the school, so on and so forth. It's a really hot topic. Um, and there's a couple of really good books out there that are very thick with research, but Jeff Cohen's um, book, which has like several presentations in the larger uh, pre presentation, like it's a lot of video YouTube videos, um, some shorter, some longer, but this book is a really great book um, in terms of kind of piecing together a lot of the different belonging um, research that's out there for social psychologists. Now, having said that, the book spends a lot of time, and this is often with happens with Stanford psychologists, I've noticed, uh, spends a lot of time thinking that randomly controlled trials are just the most magnificent thing that ever existed. And that's not as true in humans as it is in medicine or so on and so forth. So, um, that's true, and it also is is very uh, much about evolutionary psychology. So just FYI, it has some lacking moment. Nothing is perfect, but it is very good on lots of levels. That's interesting. I can't wait to, are you going to, I guess you'll write about it when you... Yeah, yeah. I Well, I, I did I did the the presentation, and I'm, I'm kind of um, presenting that to meetings, to school meetings, um, mm. and trying to get a sense, but one of the things that I'm seeing over and over and over again that we're doing is we're, um, what was really helpful and insightful about it was the cognitive bias piece. Cognitive biases um, undermine and threaten belonging. And one of the most um, ubiquitous co cognitive biases that we've seen, oh, actually, sorry, let me do this. Um, and these are really amazing moments, um, is the fundamental attribution error. So this idea that <laughs> peanuts did it way back in the day, right? Um, you know, we uh, assign something, a uh, behavioral something or a, a, a moment that, you know, something that was very context dependent and very like um, specific to a situation. We can, we assign situational um, uh, problems to the fundamental uh, entity of who that person is, like the fundamental underlying essence of who that person is. So, rather than assigning it to the situation they're in. And then we do, we do everything situationally for ourselves. So like, for instance, I love this. Sally's late to class. She's lazy. And sometimes you're like, she's lazy and stupid, but you're late to class. It was just a bad morning. Right. So that kind of idea, <laughs> and we do it everywhere. This idea of the fundamental attribution error of, of where we're just saying, um, you know, you're, you did this thing, so therefore you are X, as opposed to, oh, well, no, <laughs> actually, you got in a car accident on the way to school. That's, that's horrible, right? Um, and so that kind of idea is, I think, one of the most powerful ideas of us starting to explore and really think about, of course, cognitive biases, you can't not do they're the brain shortcuts to be able to live in the world we live in. Um, and so the best you can do is realize that you might be doing that and be reflective about whether that actually fits or not. That so 
Yeah, I just clicked on you. It's like a whole other. <laughs> yeah, it's 40, a whole 42 other slides. massive. <laughs> I do see my drawing is on slide. <laughs> it is. It is. Because that's one of the ways to to think about getting through. Uh, yeah, I really liked that drawing. <laughs> so, embracing yeah. uncertainty. Yeah. Embracing um, uncertainty. Well, I guess. Um, yeah. Other Abby says thank you. And she has to go to class. So I think we're. Unless there's other people giving you opportunity to chime in. Put on your camera and say hello, at least. <laughs> it's so uh, amazing to have you here. Thank you. Oh, oh Anne. Sorry. Oh, yes. I would love to hear. Hi, Anne. How are you doing? Hey, Krista. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. It's nice to see you. I was going to say, um, when Anne turned on her camera, I was like, oh, yeah. And Anne's, like, when there's a section you're talking about systems. And so Anne's leading a synchronous reading group about academic ableism. Which I just had oh, the joy yes. of re-listening re to the audiobook oh. on my um, my drive, and it really does uncover a lot of those, um, uh, you know, how our university was built and the structures that we oh, yeah. don't oh, uncover the assumptions. I'm going to share actually the link to anybody who wants to join that. Yeah, um, group, but I'll let yeah. Anne talk. <laughs> oh please, yes. No, I just I just wanted to turn on my camera and say hi because it's weird to see people not on Twitter or whatever. Hi. Yeah, we were lamenting the loss of Twitter. And we were. Jen and I want to be in your group. Can I be in your group? No, I guess I can't. It's Brock you sure? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, it's Anne's group. I should let Anne decide. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh... like Anne, she can come, right? She can come do our reading group. <laughs> yes, clearly. I mean, come on. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I don't know that I could actually do it because I'm trying to finish up the PhD, but I really want to. I'll try. Academic great. ableism. Woo. Have I you need seen to go it? Back. It's, a, it's a great one. Yeah, it's a good. Yeah, I need to. I need to read it. It's on my list of. I know my two, to... my two read list is atrocious. <laughs> Very long. Well, it's yeah. it's not nearly as bad as the entire. Uh, bookshelf that I have of books that are waiting to be read. <laughs> yeah, I slowed down on the purchasing and I'm just doing the download. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. it would really help with the, you know, your discussion that you were just saying about attribution errors and how sometimes like that, 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 you know, disability piece is, is often a thing that's, that's there oh, yeah. that, you know, from a power dynamic point of view, folk don't necessarily feel comfortable having that discussion about why that is a thing that happens, but that is certainly also right. a little piece to that, to that. Attribution oh, yeah. Error. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And all kinds of, of, and and I think the point that I really appreciated Jeff making is that that's that's the thing that we do that dehumanizes folks the most is that we don't think of folks as full humans in the situations that they exist in. And and we can do it either for individuals with a fundamental attribution error, or we can do it with for groups with Oh, well, some other background stuff, and then it's stereotyping, right? So it's it's basically the same idea. Um, it's just, oh man, yeah. There's a there's just a lot that goes into your brain automatically doing that without you thinking about it, and then going, no wait, let me change that. And one of the things that he says is that, you know. Uh, changing a cognitive bias. He doesn't really go into changing a cognitive bi bias. It's basically like your brain is wired like this. That's how it is. And I'm like, no, you can change cognitive biases, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and sometimes really good PLNs who help you <laughs> or therapy <laughs> who help you. So thank you, Anne, for helping me. <laughs> I feel like the big takeaway from, from your talk today um, it is this the, the the power and strength in this reflection like pausing to think about why you think things and then asking students to think about what what mm -hmm. what what did you learn what a, you know a lot of those metacognitive activities um so yeah. really been helpful yes and, yeah. the, and the pln really does help bring that out that's you know yeah. giving that space to do that for anybody who doesn't know what a pln like personal personal or professional learning network i know i was like which one are you gonna say <laughs> it's it, it could be either 
I like personal because professional I like, feels a little LinkedIn for me. <laughs> I think they can it it can be both. Can, be can both. I do a piece squared, Ellen? Sure. Sure. <laughs> because a lot of my personal learning folks are also actually professional learning folks, which was right. the power of Twitter. Right? right. Exactly. <sighs> okay, I'm gonna and stop now this it's recording. Gone. Because